Welcome to section 11 of Reproductive Embryology. In this section, we'll be discussing normal genital development. Let's get started. As an overview, you should know that genetic sex is determined at conception. So if a person has an X and a Y chromosome, their genetic sex is male. And if they have two X chromosomes, their genetic sex is female. The gonads, on the other hand, are determined by the presence or absence of the SRY gene. SRY just stands for sex determining region Y. The default development is for the embryo to develop female gonads. However, if the SRY gene on the Y chromosome is present, then the embryo will develop male gonads. Once the gonads have formed, they begin to produce hormones, which determines the internal and external genitalia that are formed. In other words, the internal and external genitalia are determined by hormones. Let's look at some images and see how exactly this happens. This is an excellent overview image that we introduced in our video on early fetal development. As a brief review, recall that after fertilization, the blastocyst implants on the uterine wall. Around week two, a bilaminar disc is formed, which includes the epiblast and hypoblast, which we can see right here. At week three, gastrulation occurs, and we end up with the formation of the endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm. After gastrulation, we can see three layers of the embryo right here, and these are inside of the amniotic cavity. The middle layer, or mesoderm, gives rise to the urinary and genital system, including an important structure known as the nephrogenic cord. From this image, we can see a cross-section at week 5 and a lateral view of a mostly formed fetus at week 12 right here. Between this point, around week 7, the urogenital system begins to form. So if we were to take a lateral view of the fetus at this time, we could see the nephrogenic cord much better. Here is a lateral view of the fetus, and we can see the nephrogenic cord right here. This structure goes through three stages, including the pronephro stage, mesonephro stage, and metanephro stage. In this image, we can see all three stages, but in reality, it starts out as the pronephros more cranially, or towards the fetus's head, and then moves downward and becomes the mesonephros and finally the metanephros. So just think of this image as kind of like a time lapse of the nephrogenic cord, and this is developing over a several week period, which allows us to see all three structures simultaneously. We discuss the nephrogenic cord and its importance in renal development in more detail in the renal chapter. For now, let's turn our attention to the yolk sac, where we can see the primordial germ cells. These migrate from the wall of the yolk sac to a part of the mesonephros, which then forms the gonadal ridge. And we can see the gonadal ridge in blue right here. The primordial germ cells and underlying mesonephros at the gonadal ridge proliferate, and together they form the undifferentiated gonads. Now, depending upon the presence of or absence of the SRY gene, we'll determine what happens next. Let's look at a flow diagram to help us more easily track what's going on. So, like I mentioned, the primordial germ cells migrate to the gonadal ridge and become undifferentiated gonads. If the SRY gene is present, it will produce testis determining factor and this promotes the development and differentiation of the undifferentiated gonads into testes. If there is no SRY gene, ovaries will develop. Once the gonads have differentiated, they start secreting sex-specific hormones. The ovaries start secreting estradiol, and the testes secrete malarian inhibitory factor from Sertoli cells and testosterone from Leydig cells. These hormones are important because they dictate what type of internal or external genitalia will form. If we return to this image, we can see the mesonephric duct and the paramesonephric duct. The mesonephric duct is also known as the Wolfian duct, and the paramesonephric duct is also known as the malarian duct. These structures are influenced by hormones and ultimately become either male or female internal genitalia. Now, instead of looking at these from a lateral view, let's look at them from the front of the fetus like this. This will allow us to see how these structures are changing over time more easily. Here we can see the undifferentiated gonads and both the mesonephric and paramesonephric ducts. Let's focus on male development first, which is shown on the right side of the image. In the presence of testosterone, which is produced from Leydig cells, the mesonephric duct will continue to develop. Also, the Sertoli cells will produce a substance known as malarian inhibitory factor, or MIF, and this suppresses the development of the paramesonephric duct, so this will degenerate, which we can see right here. At the same time, the testes begin to descend from the abdomen, which we can see in the final image over here. Notice that the gubernaculum is located on the inferior pole of the testes, and you can think of it as a fibrous band that pulls the testes down into the scrotal sac as it shortens in length. 
So in the middle image, it's quite long. And then if we look at the final image, so let's erase this red mark right here, we can see that the gray gubernaculum is quite short now. Notice that the gubernaculum helps anchor the testes within the scrotum. There are a few more details that you need to know about gonadal descent, and that can be better understood using a different image. Here we have a lateral view of the gonads descending from the abdomen into the scrotum. Notice that during early fetal development, the processus vaginalis and testes are up in the abdomen. The processus vaginalis is just an outpouching of the parietal peritoneum. We can also see several other key structures such as the developing scrotum and gubernaculum. Later in fetal development, the gubernaculum begins to shorten and brings with it the testes. Notice that the testis in this image is now shown closer to the scrotum and the gubernaculum is much shorter. We can also see the fascial covering of the spermatic cord, which is an extension of the muscles of the abdomen. Notice that in order for the testes to descend, they must press down against this fascial covering, and this in turn brings the processus vaginalis with it into the scrotum. In a fully developed neonate, the processus vaginalis closes, and the tissue remaining in the scrotum that is not compressed is known as the tunica vaginalis. As you can see from the image, there is a central cavitary region which remains filled with serous fluid, and this surrounds the testes. In females, the ovaries descend, but only slightly, so this process is irrelevant, and the processus vaginalis completely obliterates. All right, now that you understand gonadal descent, let's continue discussing the development of male internal genitalia. If you look at the final male image, notice that the paramesonephric duct degenerates and leaves behind a remnant structure known as the appendix testis, which we can see right here. This is a vestigial remnant of the paramesonephric duct and is present on the superior aspect of the testes. Finally, notice that the mesonephric duct becomes most of the internal genitalia, including the epididymis, ductus deferens, seminal vesicles, and the ejaculatory duct. We've also outlined some other anatomy in this final image to help give context to the other structures. So we can see the bladder, prostate, and scrotum. However, these are not part of the mesonephric duct. Again, they're just here to give you context and help orient you. All right, now let's focus on female development. In the presence of estradiol, which is produced from the ovaries, the paramesonephric duct will continue to develop and the mesonephric duct will degenerate. The associated remnant structure is known as the Gartner's duct, which you can see right here. This is located in the broad ligament of the uterus and may become cystic, resulting in a Gartner's duct cyst. We can also see the gubernaculum, and it can be helpful to break this up into the upper gubernaculum and lower gubernaculum. The upper portion will become the ovarian ligament, and the lower portion will become the round ligament. The paramesonephric duct becomes the internal female genitalia, including the proximal part of the vagina, the uterus, and the fallopian tubes. All right, so far we've discussed how the gonads and internal genitalia develop. Now let's discuss external genitalia. This is an image of undifferentiated external genitalia. We can see four important structures, the urogenital sinus, urogenital fold, labioscrotal swelling, and genital tubercle. In the presence of estrogen, the external female genitalia are formed, including the urethral and paraurethral glands, the greater vestibular glands, the labia minora, labia majora, glands clitoris, and vestibular bulbs. In the presence of dihydrotestosterone, the external male genitalia are formed, including the bulbourethral glands, prostate gland, ventral shaft of the penis or penile urethra, the scrotum, the glans penis, and the corpus cavernosum and spongiosum. Knowing the nitty-gritty details of this image is actually pretty low yield, but we have included them for completeness sake. It's probably a much better use of your brain power to memorize where the embryological processes we've discussed go wrong and we'll discuss this in more detail in the next lecture. All right, let's review what we've discussed so far. Again, the primordial germ cells migrate to the gonadal ridge and become undifferentiated gonads. If the SRY gene is present, it produces testis determining factor, and the undifferentiated gonads become testes. If it's not present, the gonads will become ovaries. The Sertoli cells secrete Mullerian inhibitory factor, which causes degeneration of the paramesonephric duct, and the Leydig cells secrete testosterone, and this promotes the development of the internal male genitalia. The testosterone is converted into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT, by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, and DHT is the more potent form of testosterone, which is responsible for the development of the external male genitalia. On the other hand, if the gonads become ovaries, then estradiol is produced, and this promotes the development of the external female genitalia. All right, now that you understand the normal processes, let's review with a question. If the Sertoli cells in a male infant are dysfunctional, what internal genitalia will be expected to form? Okay, recall that Sertoli cells produce Mullerian inhibitory factor, which normally results in degeneration of the paramesonephric duct. 
However, if this is absent, then both the paramesonephric duct and the mesonephric duct will form. Therefore, this male patient will have both internal female and internal male genitalia. From this diagram, you can see that the Sertoli cells normally produce malarian inhibitory factor, and this causes degeneration of the paramesonephric duct. Therefore, if this is absent, then the paramesonephric duct won't degenerate, and this male will end up developing internal female genitalia along with internal male genitalia. All right, that should be everything you need to know about normal genital development.